I'm Brian McAwee and I'm a lecturer in philosophy at the University of Southampton. In this video, I'm going to introduce the higher and lower pleasures. The distinction between higher and lower pleasures was drawn by John Stuart Mill, the most well-known British moral philosopher of the 19th century. Mill was a utilitarian. He thought that we should live in whatever way best promotes the general happiness. Now, what is happiness? Mill says that a happy life is one that contains as much pleasure as possible and as little pain or suffering as possible. Many of Mill's contemporaries rejected his view that what makes for a good life for humans is the pleasure that it contains. Thomas Carlyle, for instance, suggested that Mill's utilitarianism was a doctrine worthy only of swine. Surely there's more to human life than just pleasure, says Carlyle. A life of pleasure alone may be fit for animals, but certainly not for human beings. So utilitarianism is a moral philosophy fit only for animals and not for humans. Now Mill has two responses to Carlyle's objection. First, Mill says, humans are capable of much richer pleasures than animals are. Pursuing more intellectual pastimes generally gives us a greater amount or quantity of pleasure than those pastimes that animals can enjoy. Reading a great book or watching a great film, for instance, can afford us pleasures that stay with us over a, life over a lifetime, enriching our lives over many years. But Mill has a second response. He argues that it's not just the quantity of pleasures that contributes to how well your life goes. It's not just the intensity and duration of each pleasure that matters, but another factor as well that Mill calls the quality of the pleasures involved. Mill says, it's quite compatible with the principle of utility to recognize the fact that some kinds of pleasure are more desirable and more valuable than others. It would be absurd that while in estimating all other things, quality is considered as well as quantity, the estimation of pleasures should be supposed to depend on quantity alone. The higher pleasures are those that have greater quality than others. Now, how are we to find out which pleasures are of higher quality. Mill thinks we should turn to the verdict of competent judges, those who are well acquainted with each kind of pleasure. Mill says, of two pleasures, if there be one to which all or almost all who have experience of both give a decided preference, irrespective of any feeling of moral obligation to prefer it, then that is the more desirable pleasure. Now, it's not the verdict of the judges that make some pleasures better for us, simply that their well-informed preferences is evidence, and the best evidence that we have, that these are what's best for us. Mill himself thinks that the verdict of these competent judges will be pretty clear-cut. The pastimes they prefer will be those which engage the intellect and distinctively human emotions, rather than the body, the senses, and so on. Those pleasures that we share with animals. Now, it could be that Mill's methodology is correct, that the best evidence that we have of what's good for us, what the best pleasures are, is indeed the judgment of these experienced competent judges but that in fact, most such judges would disagree with Mill's verdict. So Mill himself may not be a competent judge. So Mill could be right that there are higher pleasures, ones of greater quality than others, but incorrect about which these are. What do you think?